So I'm here today uh, for Kate's Book Club members. Thank you for joining in. Um, this is Anthony Dore, and he is the author of Memory Wall, which is our January pick, um, and I just finished it yesterday. All right. I love it. So I want this to be impromptu conversation, more or less, not so much an interview. Or sure. I'm giving Whatever you a book you report on your book. Okay. <laughs> Do you often read collections of stories? I haven't. This would be the first. Cool. I started the book club last March. And so, um, and then the uh, Learning Lab contacted me and said, have you heard about Anthony's book? Oh, He's a local awesome. author, right. and I, I've heard of you, of course. And then, but I said, no, I, I hadn't heard about, or I hadn't thought about selecting it for my book club, but let's schedule it out. So, because I had book, so many books picked, and so that's when we said January. And she said, well, that's perfect. He's speaking at the L Lunch for Literacy. Yeah, so that's right. So it just tied in perfect. Oh, that's good. Yeah. Well, thanks for, for helping publicize that. Yeah. It's a great lunch. It's yeah. A great, important cause. It's like 15% of their budget. Comes yeah, from it comes from the Literacy for Lunch, which, by the way, is February 4th at Boise Center, and you can still get your tickets. It's a fabulous cause, and I'll be there, and Anthony's going to be there. So, yeah, I have yeah. to write my speech. I just, I am fascinated by this book. All right. I just Thanks. can't, it is. Talk it's, about it. Okay, so where did the, where did the ideas come from? Was there something personal that brought this to the pages? Uh, yes. Um, the easy answer to that, although it's often more complicated than a single idea, the easy answer is that my grandmother moved in with us when I was about 16 uh, with Alzheimer's. But, you know, that was like before I knew what Alzheimer's was. I mean, I was only 16, but people weren't really saying the word Alzheimer's a lot. We just knew things were going pretty wrong with grandma and I was self-centered 16 year old I was going to high school my brothers were off in college and I didn't understand really the level of grief my mother was going through as she watched her mother forget who she was and yeah. you know grandma would come to dinner and have no idea who we were and kind of accuse us sometimes of taking her purse and and there were really funny things like she she could beat me in gin rummy she didn't know who I was you know but she could <laughs> crush me in cards and, you know, Christmas, she would open a present and then look in her lap and kind of rediscover it with all this joy all over again. And so in a lot of ways, the first story in this book, a lot, a lot of the stories deal with dementia, but um, the first story really was began with a way to try to re-understand now that I'm an adult what kind of grief that causes a family. And that was one of the questions I posted, because our book club is online. So okay. one of the first questions I posted about Memory Wall, the first short story, was do would would you want the memory cap? And and so I'm wondering now, hearing your story, is that what you were kind of hoping for your grandmother? Was that someone would invent a memory cap? Even though it's, it sounded a little gruesome in the it book, especially uh, with the boy. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, what Kate's talking about is that I invent this idea that maybe you can preserve individual memories on little cartridges, and then maybe they can even outlive you in a sense after your memories are gone. You know, I, I was just trying to ask a question of the reader is would this be a good thing, you know, to preserve ourselves? In some ways, books are like those little cartridges in that they can preserve a person's thoughts and yeah. dreams after a person's dead. And I always thought it would be so hard for the person, for like for you, and you're having your own grandmother not know who you were versus being the person who doesn't remember. But then um, with That's Alma, you, you know, you created her in such a way that I just felt awful for her and it must have been so frustrating and she has these cartridges and she has a memory cap on but it's still sometimes not clicking and connecting I think I think yeah I think if you're losing your memory there are still windows of clarity in which you realize what's happening to you at the beginning and those are terrible moments terrifying I thought so when she would read the note of Tall Man in the Yard. That was like a terrifying moment. I'm like, she knows that this isn't right, but she doesn't know why. Yeah. 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 And so it was, but yeah, so I posted that and a lot of people were saying, you know, would, it, would you want to try and have the memories come back to you or would you just rather let them go and be what they are? And I loved the connection of her husband looking for fossils and you know, I I hope okay, you don't mind. Great, good. No, but I hope you cool. don't mind. I wrote in the book, and I'm like, of I wonder if, if authors are upset that you write in the book. But the connection with the fossils, and that's what animals can leave behind. But you know, we're not going. We don't. Um, thank goodness, go around digging up human skeletons. I mean, obviously with Some anthology. Yeah, and anthropologist. as my brother's an anthropologist, I say that. But I mean, you know, it's just like the idea of the fossil. It's like, okay, well, he's there in this giant fossil that they find. But will they ever find anything like that of Alma or... Great. Or of any of us. Is the yeah, of any of us. 
So I wrote all these notes in here. Cool, that's yeah. flattering. I oh, like it is? That. I would just couldn't stop. I was like underlining things and... That's why I can't yeah. go to a Kindle because I, I write I can't either. Books, so oh, I good. I was that. that I'm skipping, but in Village 113, uh -huh. as they're going to flood all this and all those memories are going to go away, I question though, does water on top of like flooding something, does that really destroy the memories of what that used to be? Yeah, great question. I don't know. I mean, Lake and Cascades over a town. I know. There's a bunch of lakes in Idaho. That yeah, and so I had just a bunch of questions about this one. Like, I underlined so many things. The mom made me just so sad. He just wanted to, like, scoop her up and be like, go, go to safety. And it said she just <laughs> wants to stay with her seeds. But could you understand maybe why she also wants to stay? I mean, yes, yeah, okay. I could. I definitely could. And then, you know, torn with her son and, you know, how unattached he was to the whole situation. Yes, and to place. You know, I feel like in my generation, especially so many of us went to college and moved to different places. And, you know, I live in Boise. I grew up in Ohio. And, you know, we are not as attached to the places where we grew up. And there's mm -hmm. something great about that, but there's also something really sad about that. Yeah, I think so, too, because my mom moved out of the house that I grew up in. And so then it's like, you don't have that place. Like, yeah. you don't go back and... Oh my gosh, she still has my trophies up and my ribbon. No, there I don't have that place anymore. Yeah. Yeah. And there's something physical. The memories are more physical when you're in that place. And now they yeah. exist only in your head. And you go somewhere and some other kids got his posters up on your wall. Yeah, you know? or someone's sewing room or something. Yeah. 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 And even with her, I part of me didn't want her to leave. I wanted her and the school teacher to stay. And maybe drown. And yeah, and I did. I'm like, oh, if he goes there, that's going to be so hard. But then it, like, I just was like, no, stick with it. Like, I could totally understand her and her and the seeds. And there was one line in here that I just, I think I wrote it down at the end because I, um, maybe it was seeds are the dreams, plants dream while they sleep. And I loved that. I just thought it was just so amazing. And then, so like seeds can then sprout new dreams. And something new begins because the plant is growing. And good, all yeah. right, Kate, uh, awesome. No, love but it. I just I was I was reading this <laughs> and I was like, okay, so then she moves on to this new life with her son, and that's something new to her because they didn't it didn't sound like they lived together as adults. Right. So then there's that new memory they could make, her new life. That's true. Although I kind of. Um, uh, at the end of the story, I don't really allow them to have yeah. a lot of happy memories. No, there's not a lot of happy memories. But uh, when I was reading it, I'm like, okay, okay, there can be new memories. Good. Instead Good. when she's leaving. Yeah. So and I do let her carry on this, a few seeds by giving them to uh, her what's yeah. her son or whatever you call her. And I liked that, how she like starts a little seed garden yeah. and things like that. Um, okay. There is something miraculous about a seed. If you look at it, you're like... You know, you hold an acorn that your kid picked up, and you're like, there's an oak tree implicit in that thing. I stare at trees all the time and think that. I'm like, this came from a seed. Yeah. And, like, maybe a seed that a squirrel just dropped along its way, and there it was. I, I think about that all the time. Full These huge trees. Yeah. And it is. And it is, like, the beginning of something. Yeah. And then it can carry on and grow into something else. Yeah. So. And it's the end. It's like a coffin at the same time. You know? Oh, yeah. It was. That was a great story. And that's the award that you won the, the award uh, for that yeah, one, that right? Yeah, that story won what's called the Henry Prize, yeah. Yeah, that was, it was great. Thanks. Okay, so then, i got to say, the second story frustrated me. Okay. Procreate and okay. generate. Okay, cool. Tell me about it. <laughs> what was the point of not... Okay, oh, the ending frustrated The ending, all right, all right. which first I have to say, did you pick Wyoming because it is a barren wasteland? <laughs> I have to say that, and I love Wyoming, Jackson Hole, Yellowstone, Cody, but you picked Laramie, right? Yes, yeah, Laramie. It's the armpit of Wyoming, and I had to think <laughs> the way this woman can't have babies, and if you were barren and reading this, I'm not insulting you, but that part of Wyoming is desolate, and that's what I kind of envisioned with her not being able to have babies. I wondered if you yeah, did I make that connection. Yeah, I think there is a parallel to it. I yeah. was really interested in the idea of folks struggling with infertility and living in rural areas. That happens a lot in Idaho, too, where... You know, somebody in Fairfield say, you know, you want to deal with your infertility problem, you got to get in the car and drive an hour, sometimes in snowstorms. And, and that was them going to Cheyenne, and yeah. it took forever. So and that then, was very, very present in my mind. It's like, how do people in rural states, especially in states that don't mandate uh, that health care companies cover infertility treatments, you know, so you got to pay for it out of your pocket, very expensive treatments. You know, how bad do you want a kid? How, how hard do you want yeah. to work for it? And then the part also, I was, it was eye-opening to me to see how hard and sad that must be when you're trying to have a baby and you can't, 
and then your coworkers are all, we're having a baby and it's great. And I did my heart broke every time the husband would have to deal with that. Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, my boys can swim. I know, and you're sitting there like, oh, and the doctor just told me that it might be my fault. And and then the way you portrayed her, I mean, you the, the way you portrayed the pressure that she must have felt, you know, because at first when before they knew, and then she's just thinking, oh, it takes a year and you get off birth control. And then, I mean, you did such a wonderful job of writing that because you just sympathize with her. And it's like, and then, like, you could just feel her pain when she's, it's not, it's both of them. And then, you know, try this and that. And then he's asking, oh, is it going to happen this time? And every time I'm like, oh, the stress this woman must feel. But then the ending tells me that that is not an important there's, I was worried I missed something in the story then. Okay, good. I get this question all the time. Uh, yeah, at the end of the story, I let them go through two rounds of IVF, and then I don't tell the reader if the second one worked. And that's because, I may have made a mistake, but I, because for me, the story became more about their marriage and less about whether or not they're going to have a baby. I feel like I tempt him with this student misty Fried. I was turning every page. I'm like, he better not. <laughs> right. He better not. Right, you know, he's maybe going to cheat on his wife and... I guess I can say that ultimately he chooses not to. And for me, it was more about, will this marriage survive this really stressful, anxiety-producing thing, which is infertility? And, and I thought about that as I was reading it, too. I'm like, I, how do you survive something like this when he's putting pressure on her and he wants it so bad, but he doesn't understand it's physically something she can't do? Oh, I know. I mean, I don't remember. When I was researching the story, I'm sure I knew this statistic by heart. It's something like 60% or 50% of couples going through this don't last. You know, such a huge challenge yeah. to throw into a marriage. So, so for me, it became when, at the end, when he's like, do you still love me? Do you love me? It became more about, okay, regardless of whether or not they end up being parents, this marriage can, has made it through this. And so that's the resolution I thought the story needed. I was, I got there, and I'm like, what? I want to know is what I wrote down. <laughs> I get that. Every I'm like, I want to know. Visit, I get readers from somewhere. I don't even know them. They write. Oh, they do. Did they get pregnant? <laughs> it's like the one thing that's... You're like, wait, you missed the whole point of the story. Yeah. So, well, but... There is no point. The point is just to ask questions of a reader, like, how would you behave in these circumstances, you know? Yeah, and I am keeping my fingers crossed that I don't have to go through that, because I don't know if I'd be strong enough to do it. I know. Yeah. I know. But like, you would be. If you decide you want a kid, you would be. You know, it's yeah. amazing what humans can go through if they want something. Yeah, that's true. I've had friends that tried and tried and did in vitro and all the things, and then finally they were just like, let's just be at peace with ourselves. And then they decide to go through adoption, and was, they're like, oh, we're having a baby in a month. And then they get pregnant. Wow. Yeah, and so it's wow. like, how come your brother's seven months older than you? Well, let me tell you this, you know what I mean? So There is something to that, like relaxing and not putting pressure sometimes works. Yeah, I've had a couple friends that's actually happened to that way, where they finally just relaxed, and then it happened and they're in the adoption process. So, wow. yeah, you never know, like you it's said. Miracle. Um, the Demilitarized Zone. That was right. a good one. Well, thanks. Yeah. yeah, the only story set in Idaho in there. Yeah, in Sun Valley. Yeah. Sad. Yeah. I hated the ex-wife. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, yeah. yeah. And it was just... But then to have... So the father has all... Or the grandfather has Alzheimer's. Yeah. And then the father has a son who's in the military. Yeah. And, um, and then the ex-wife had left. And they hadn't told the son yet because he's overseas. And so, but I loved the line where it says, where do memories go once we've lost our ability to summon them? Hmm. And that scared me. Yeah, I don't think, I think they're erased, right? I mean, they're gone. Maybe. But what if someone else has a memory of, but it's not your memory? Yeah, they can trigger it. What's really interesting how things like cameras change, like my kids' memories. My kids' memories are so determined by, like, the videos we show them of themselves or the pictures they look from of themselves uh, on trips. You know, I was the youngest of three, and, like, my mom probably has, like, five pictures of me going up. <laughs> she was exhausted. And, you know, I don't... My memories are just... I don't have any verification or proof of them, really. Yeah. But my kids, like, you know, I have probably 5,000 pictures of them on my computer that they can look at at any time, you know. And they're like, oh, yeah, I forgot that, and that happened, and we went here. Yeah. And in some ways, that, that overwrites different. the original memory. You know, and sometimes it summons memories for them, but when you're a kid, I think it overwrites whatever memories they had, and now that they have your pictures more than the actual events. And that's, that's true. Um, the river, I can't say this right. Never, Namunas. N Namunas? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, um, I just, that was Mrs. Sabo. Mrs. Sabo's In the boat. 
older person suffering from memory loss. Yeah, there's, I guess, five of them in the book. There are five, but I just loved the part how you had them fishing, and I have to get to my notes. Um, oh, this part where they're fishing, and, like, the dog is barking, and then she she catches something. She's got something on her line, and she digs her heels in, and it's like she knew. She didn't know she knew how to fish, but, like, the instinct kicked in. And yeah, I'm good. like, okay, there has to be some memory there that's tri this is triggering. Yes, yeah, good. That's yeah. what I intended. And then how she got excited about that one corner around the river. Like, the she said every time she took her around one corner, she would perk up. And she could tell a difference in her body language and how she was around the river. Yeah. And so I was like, okay, what if you could, like, keep taking someone back to something they did? Because she fished every day. Yeah, as a younger as woman. As a younger woman. And then, yeah. So I was like, oh, good. Then maybe the memories you know, can come back. I just thought, I loved it how she didn't know she knew what to do, but her body did. Yeah, and so I, I just good. thought... That's good. Yeah, that's totally intentional. I was. I was like, oh, that's awesome. And then how the grandfather made tombstones. Yeah. And I was like, the thinking, hey, that could be one of your, that's the last memory of you. Yeah, you bet. If you, if, and you know, unless, you know, you're cremated, there, or, obviously people can do other stuff with urns and stuff, but yeah, the tombstone is your last or our last memory of someone who's passed on. And so I just thought that was neat how you intertwined all yeah, of that good. together. Yeah, great. And yeah. I put them in this really old place. I moved them from the new world to the old world to Lithuania where, you know, the ground is literally soaked with the blood of so many wars. And, you know, and gravestones there are so different. As I mentioned in the story, you know, gravestones there are these photorealistic lights. Yeah, like a life-size picture of a mobster. Yeah. I could totally picture that. It was like... But even of us, like our family would respect us by like getting a photo etched onto granite, you know, so yeah. that we'd be smiling there in black and white on our tombstone forever. And you go to these graveyards and there's just face after face and it's a little more personal or it's just different experience than walking through an American graveyard. Now, have you been to Lithuania? Uh-huh. You have? Yeah. Is that where this, that's why you want to sit there? Because you went there first, or did you go I there because I went there first. Of... Um, yeah. I spent a month there working with teachers. Uh, oh, wow. Probably the beginning, maybe like 2000. Um, so, yeah. No, you, often I'll go visit a place, I keep a journal while I'm there, but I don't necessarily know what sort of fiction I'll sit there until after I'm home. And then it just sort of comes to you. Yeah. Sort of, yeah, you work on it for days and days. And, days. and you're like, I wish it would just come to me so <laughs> yeah, Exactly. So, but there, I liked this one too because it was so matter of fact, just the way you wrote it. It was simple. It wasn't, you know, like, and I thought maybe that's the way the Lithuanian culture is, where it's just matter of fact, like we're going to the store. I don't know how to, I wish I would have underlined some of the lines that you wrote, but I just liked the way it was. It was like, and now she's going to Lithuania. Yeah, well, it's first person, and that's a yeah. big difference. That's, you know, Allie's narrating the mm -hmm. story. And I, I saw her as a very matter-of-fact girl. In a lot of ways, she's a lot more grown-up than And she needs 14. to be. Yeah, definitely. Well, that's because her parents are dead. Yeah, and then the dog, the poodle. I, just, I have a thing for dogs. I, thought was, I know, mishap. I thought that was great. Um, what else did I underline? Oh, in that one, if I've... It's as if I hooked into a big, impossible plug of sadness resting at the bottom of the river. And just how she tried to avoid. I thought, she, I, at times I could feel like she was avoiding thinking about her parents. And then there was this other times, like, overwhelming, like a flood. Yeah. You know, and I it was just all hit the her. time. This year, yeah. Kind of keep the blinder on, but it's mm -hmm. this huge thing that overwhelms the blinder. I mean, of course. Yeah. That's was, how I would deal with it. Right there. Time. And then um, I put, as the river flows, Mrs. Sable's memory was flowing. It was sort of coming to her. Right. So, okay. Yeah. I like yeah. it. Oh, I loved this. Um, oh, and then this one. We peer at the past through murky water. All we can see are shapes and figures. How much is real and how much is merely threads and tombstones. And I thought that's true because if you think of your past, like you said, what, I was there? I don't remember being there. And it does. It becomes murky to us. Yeah. No yeah, question. and it's kind of like with the cartridges going back to memory wall where you're like, maybe I should be recording all of this. And then, maybe we are with cameras and all the stuff we can do these days and podcasts and stuff like this. This interview will live on forever. So, um, <laughs> Feel free to take it down after. <laughs> no, we're, it's forever. Um, and then Afterworld. It was hard for me to get into. 
Okay. But so the ask flipping. the most of the reader because I flip a lot between yeah. the time. Yeah. But when they, but then once you flipped, I was like, okay, I need to. I want him to go back to the orphanage, or I want him to go. I need to know what Robert's do, Robert's doing right now with her. You know what yeah, I mean? That's great so, for me to know. Yeah. That's good. No, it was just a little, a little tough. But like, I'm not the smartest reader, so I'm just oh, saying. You're doing beautifully. But, but yeah, so once I got into it, and I'm, it maybe have just taken me to like two of the flipping back and forth. Then I'm like, okay, I'm into this, and. She, you create her in such a way that you just want to protect her. That's you just want to reach out and, and I just loved her. I just couldn't stop. I just couldn't stop reading it. Was, you just did a beautiful job with her. That's real. I mean, that deportation manifest, the list of girls taken out of Hamburg is real. I made up all the names or changed all the names, but I found this manifest of 13 names and you look at the birth dates and they're all about, you know, the oldest was 16 when they're shipped off to... A concentration camp to be killed it's like to be exterminated and yet the record keeping is so methodical that they list their birth dates and their names and it was yeah and the way you did that with and it just gives me chills to think about it how you know Nancy got sent off to Warsaw and and then it, she's like thinking it's a palace and this great place and I couldn't figure out if uh, the lady at the orphanage uh, Fran I couldn't figure out Fran. if she knew or not Oh, I don't know. Fra I think Frau Lena eventually intuited maybe that they would be murdered. But there, it wasn't common knowledge because they took no. the radios out. Exactly. So when you heard Warsaw, you didn't know it was a concentration camp. Well, no. Certain, like, actually, it turns out Nancy was quite lucky to be sent to Warsaw because it's not an extermination camp. And so she's in a concentration camp where... Or where she's sewing buttons. Where she's yeah. working. Yeah. And, and that was the sad thing where she writes the letter and says, I'm sewing all day. And, then, and it wasn't as happy as they'd all thought she would be. Yeah. Yeah, but the way how you dropped in, like, you know, names of places, and these girls are so naive, which, thank goodness, you I know. know. I, would, I couldn't imagine them being on a truck, and I don't. I'm, I'm one of those that like to be naive and stick my head in the sand with some stuff, and I just was like, okay, I couldn't think about that, of being on a truck and thinking and knowing where you're going, even though I know there were a lot of Holocaust victims that did. But, but that's true, but who would want to face? I mean, what the... What the Nazis had working in their favor is nobody would want to believe the utter abominable nature of what was going on. Like, who wants to believe, oh, you're just going to put a bunch of people in a van and drive them off and kill them? Like, yeah. it's much easier to believe. Oh, we're going to a spa town. You know, we'll be treated well. They yeah. just don't want us here. They just don't want us here. And then this doorkeeper, who when it finally did hit him, like, yes. like, okay, yeah, this is real. This is happening. They're coming. And then... That was an attention grabbing moment. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, just the way that Esther was when you put her in the bike cart. Oh, yeah. I just could picture her riding around, and it was like this wonderful moment for her. And then, you know, when he breaks, when he, um, right here it says, when she asked him to get her out of the hospital, and it says, Are you asking me to help you die? And she says, I'm asking you to help me live. For me, the book is about aging in a lot of ways, and all of our fears of death and forgetting who we are. And you know, what I learned with my grandmother is that everything we are, everything that is ourself, is our memory. You know, if you can't remember anything about yourself, you don't exist. Really, yourself is gone. And that's why Alzheimer's and dementia are so sad, because it is exactly like you said. And I mean, it's just... so scary for me. I mean, it's like you know that that some version of that is going to happen to all of us. You know. I mean, mm -hmm. Everybody eventually forgets who they are, whether or not they die in a car accident that happens immediately or it happens over a little period. The title Memory Wall, did that come from, like, our memories eventually hit a wall? Uh, no, I mean, for, for me, it's the obvious title for the first story. I yeah. had that pretty early. And then I just knew that I wanted to write stories that were tied by a thematic question about memory. You know, what is memory and what does it mean to us? And so I thought, well, I'll just use the title stories. The title oh, I liked it now. I Oh, what story were you touched by the most, and why? Oh, my own story, you mean? Yeah, well, uh, of, of these, which one was, like, your baby? Uh, you know, it's because you work so many hours on them, you start to kind of resent them. You know? yeah. <laughs> You're like, I just want to finish. So, uh, you know, I don't get touched necessarily by my own work. You know, that's why I read other people's work. I mean, you know, Memory Wall took me the longest, the first story, and, it, and I struggled so, with so much with the structure. You know, it's told in these little pieces that are kind of like the cartridges that are on the Memory Wall to the point where I was laying out paragraphs all over the office floor and rearranging them, trying to understand the order that the reader would read them in. 
So in some ways, it was the best feeling when it was done. <laughs> that sense of accomplishment. Okay, so tell me, speaking of, you read other authors, who do you, who does an author enjoy reading? Um, well, I read a lot. I mean, I can divide that up into, like, dead authors, male authors, living authors. Um, what are you reading right now? Let's start there. Um, I'm reading a book called uh, A Visit from the Goon Squad by Jennifer Egan. Okay. It's got a lot of attention this year. And it's a, it's a very cool book. It's kind of like a ring of stories. It is, it's a novel, but... Each chapter is radically different from the next, and they tell the story of two people through um, different narrators, and it moves back and forth through time. The Goon Squad becomes kind of time, like time is a bunch of goons. As oh, okay. Characters. We put a link to your website on the book page, uh, the book club page, which obviously you're on right now if you're watching this. But what are some of your other uh, books that if readers want to continue on with Anthony Doerr? Um, yeah, my first book was a collection of stories also called The Shell Collector. Collector. And then I wrote a, a novel called About Grace and that came out in 2006. And, the, and he goes to Boise for about 40 pages in that book. How does he? And then uh, my third book was a memoir. We moved to Rome for a year. We won a prize that sent us from Boise to Italy. And our boys were brand new. We had twin boys. So I wrote a book about the, that year we spent in Rome. Oh, how fun. You know, that was like, yeah. <laughs> it was amazing. It was exhausting, but it was amazing. Oh, amazing experience. We were glad to come home. Awesome. And I'm working on a novel now, so that'll be my fifth book. Good stuff. And if you want more with Anthony, like I said, uh, we're going to be at the Literacy for Lunch Lunch for Literacy event at the Boise Center um, on February 4th. And you can get your tickets are available uh, through the learninglab.org. That's it. So cool. thank you for taking the time. Yeah, it's fun. Yeah, Thanks this was really fun. Oh, my gosh. I loved it.